But I would argue, uh, and perhaps I'll argue tonight, that, that any approach that does not uh, purport to uh, keep faith with the original meaning of the Constitution's text is essentially the living Constitution theory. It's a theory that says that the meaning of the Constitution can change from day to day. Uh, today's Thursday, maybe it means something different from what it meant Wednesday, and, and who knows what tomorrow may bring. Um, I, think that's, uh, I think that's a dangerous theory. Um, with the living Constitution, the power to impose that forced association that is government gets concentrated in a very few hands uh, in the federal judiciary and in Congress. And uh, that it's not what the founders envisioned, and I would argue that's not the way our republic should be run. Um, here are the real pro problems as I see them with these statutes. So the first one is that most of these statutes, education, Medicaid, and all the rest of it, they're kind of old statutes. And the contractual metaphor doesn't really capture what's going on, because these are now bilateral monopolies. Neither can withdraw. So the states complain about underfunding, and the feds complain about states shirking. Uh, and both are right, and both are kind of wrong. And the only thing that satisfies all of them is pump more money into the system, which is what we've done consistently to no good results. So the contract metaphor can't really handle that, but we need a doctrine to handle these kinds of bilateral monopoly problems and the strategic behavior on both sides. And the second thing is what's coercive about these uh, funding programs uh, is not so much the program itself, it's the fiscal asymmetry because a state that withdraws from these kinds of programs, um, well, the citizens have to pay the taxes anyhow for these kinds of programs and that induces states to participate in these programs. Um, the court understood that very well because Paul Clement made that point in his briefs. Um, but it couldn't say that out loud uh, and it couldn't deal with it, first because there's a bunch of old precedents, much beloved by Richard Epstein, actually not, um, uh, that, that, that stand in the way. And the second thing is that the fiscal asymmetry is true of every conditional spending program on the books. And you couldn't handle that problem in this particular case. Um, and so both of these problems, uh, I think a lot will depend in the future on whether the court and the rest of us uh, can figure out how to get handle on these quasi-contractual problems and, the pro uh, the, the prob and, and on the problem of, of these fiscal asymmetries. I guess I'd say this brings me back full circle to the difference between lawyers and non-lawyers. So, for lawyers, these are difficult questions, all this doctrine about the Commerce Clause and the Spending Clause and whatnot. Non-lawyer, what you do is you crack open Article One, Section 8 and read through this list of powers that Congress has. There are 18 little clauses. It's not so long. You can read it in five minutes. You can think about each one in five minutes and uh, none of them are at all plausible for the enacting of Obamacare on the text of the thing, on the words that are on the page. You know, I think for non-lawyers, it's actually quite an easy question. It's only lawyers and their doctrine that make, make these yeah. things so difficult. I mean, one does, sentence. Okay. One sentence. Professor, yeah, one <laughs> sentence. I can't do that. That was a long but, sentence. It was an Epstein <laughs> sentence. Professor Epstein. If, if I had to think of, in terms of current doctrine, the single worst aspect of the Obamacare decision by Justice Roberts, Chief Justice, it's that until this time, we always thought the end run point was in fact a fair one. You can't use the commerce power uh, or the taxing power where the commerce power doesn't go. And the moment he says, oh, we can't get it under commerce, but we can get it under taxation, the very case that he cited for it, which was the child labor case, stands for exactly the opposite proposition. So it was completely disingenuous use of authority. And the question about whether or not we can tax in action has the following absurdity. As I last counted, there were 4,987,000,000 things that I'm not doing at this moment, and each of them is subject to taxation. Um, it's just a kind of a joke. That is, you go through the entire history, and essentially non-performance has always been subject to penalties if you want to do it, and you have to be careful as to which ones you pick. And so he picks the kind of thing which is so odd that you know it's not a serious precedent because given the catastrophe that one will see when Obamacare unravels as it will, uh, nobody will ever try a mandate again. So this is a one-horse wonder. <laughs>